Thank you. Um, so a quick introduction about me. Uh, I'm Stephen Poole. I work at Oxford Nanopore, um, a biotech company in Oxford. Uh, I've been coding for about 10 years in Python. Um, I've been to quite a few Europythons, but this is my first ever talk, so fingers crossed. <laughs> so where do I work? Um, like I said, um, it's at Oxford Nanopore, which is a biotech company. Um, one of the cool things about this is we make a device, here's an example of one, um, that sequences DNA. Um, it's quite a cool thing. Um, it's also very portable, um, which means I can say that some of my Python code has been run in the space station, which is, yeah, also pretty cool. Um, so this talk is mainly on some things that I found uh, useful whilst working on configs at uh, Oxford Nanopore. Uh, their ideas, tips, they may not be applicable to every situation. This is kind of just inspire you to maybe make um, different, more interesting configs than you might usually do. Um, so I'm going to give a brief introduction to the file format I'm going to go through. Um, then four um, different examples of how um, you might structure config files better. Uh, and then just some tips at the end. So before going in, uh, what is a config file? Uh, this is a really simple one on the screen. Um, you might use it for a web server application, as in you're just telling the server what part to use and maybe what file to load when you go to the slash endpoint. Um, but why do people need um, configuration files? Uh, the, idea, the idea is to change settings without going into the code. Th that, that's it, really. That's all you need to look for. It. Um, programs can be configuration driven, which means that um, configuration files can be a first class citizen in your program. Uh, which can not only change uh, the values in your programs, but also how they actually run themselves. Uh, a really good example of this is like a GitLab YAML file. Um, that so like can be a huge configuration file which controls entirely how your pipeline runs, how, how everything runs. Um, so I'm going to talk about um, Toml in this configuration, but the, um, it's applicable to basically anywhere where you get a dictionary um, for config files. Um, a quick example, if you don't know Toml, uh, the square brackets um, mean basically it's another entry in your dictionary. And those double square brackets are called tables, uh, and they make a list of dictionaries. Like I said, the, the talk is applicable for any config file formats, but for uh, conciseness, I will show the Toml version on the left. But if you use YAML or something else, again, it's, as long as you've got a dictionary, everything is applicable. Uh, oh, and if you want to load this, uh, it's quite simple in Python 3.11 because Tomalib is included. So let's get wound up with an obvious example that should, that should make a lot of sense to you guys. Um, back in the older days, <laughs> you might see config files that look like this. For instance, if we were making a smart home system, uh, we might have a living room heater, we set the temperature, how good to set that temperature uh, when it would get um, turned off. Uh, problems with these are, should be quite obvious. Um, in that the names are very long, they're very verbose. Um, it's hard to find duplicate lines. Um, and it's hard to make a new room. You have to copy and paste, rename living room like 16 times or something ridiculous. So a better idea um, is if you force a hierarchy in your configs. Uh, this means um, it can be easier to pass and the same sections can't be uh, repeated, especially in Toml, because if you define the same section twice, you get an error, you get a nice free runtime check. Uh, one really nice thing about this, what I call separation of concerns, because you're um, structuring your config file in a hierarchy, you can do really nice things like pass part of the config file to your program and you don't have to worry about it. Uh, the main method doesn't really know how it sets temperature. It can just grab all these values, send them along, and the temperature, file, uh, the temperature function actually deals with it. So we're going to a bit more of a mm, complex example now. Uh, so for the rest of this talk, we're going to consider we're a food company. Uh, we're full of she uh, chefs, bakers, and our product is smart kitchens. Um, because, to be honest, I love food. That's, Prague has great food. <laughs> um, so you've fully decided uh, to compartmentalize this code. 
So for instance, you have your oven settings, um, which might import from another config file, your mixer might import from something else, your recipe might import from somewhere else. Just a caveat, import is not an inbuilt keyword in Toml. Um, you would have to implement it yourself. Uh, there was a link to the slides at the beginning. Uh, it is on GitHub if you want to have a quick look. It will be there at the end as well. Um, but the great thing about this is that if you update, say, settings for fan oven, it will then change every single recipe that has a fan oven, which is, which is usually what you want. Um, because engineers love abstraction, we hate redundancy. Um, but let's consider we go on site and set up. Um, but the customers actually wanted a cookie recipe, not a brownie recipe. That's okay, we have like an army of bakers, uh, so they can go and figure out how we actually make uh, cookies. So they might say you mix at a lower speed, you don't add chocolate. Um, so for the bakers on site to do this, they will have to go find which imports to change, go find those files, copy and paste those files, change the values inside those files, uh, and that's just one iteration. Um, if they were changing the files to try and figure out the best recipe, they would then have to do this again and again and again, um, which is quite a lot of effort for someone on site who's already stressed. Um, so what about instead, if we store it as a .tom or .template maybe, and then when we go to uh, build time to ship our product, we then uh, turn that .tom or .template into a .tom. We do all the imports, then the uh, flat file configs are on site, they can edit them, and in our code base we have a nice, um, well-structured, well, no redundancy. Um, sorry, just getting the right notes. Um, so that's perfect, uh, we're gonna, we're gonna uh, ship this entire config. But then QA come along, they want to check the recipes. Um, they have the exact same problem that the bakers had at the start. They have to go through each of these files to have a look what the settings are, um, to, to figure out what the product is actually going to do when it runs. So now we have a problem. So maybe we store the .toml .template and the .toml, uh, and then we keep them in sync somehow, maybe with pre-commits or scripts, whatever, it doesn't really matter, uh, and we check both these in. That's kind of the best of both worlds in a way, um, but now you have lots of new recipes coming in, uh, and you've got to make more of these tumbles. Uh, the reason why you have to make them um, is because of all this import structure. Uh, chefs and bakers might not know the best way to make sure that you're not using multiple different import files or when to change certain import files. So really what I'm saying is we might be stuck with one file, um, but is that, is that much of a problem? Let, let's consider the, the two recipes that I just said. Um, so here's what, here's what it might look like to make a uh, brownies or cookies. Um, so on the left, uh, we have the brownies recipe, which has chocolate, the mix of speed is medium, and the consistency is maybe a bit thicker because it's a, a brownie batter. So these are just a few obvious changes in the entire, in the entire config file. So, so let's consider why we didn't want the flat file. Redundancy is one, uh, and also only update things that must get updated. So what if instead we try to encode that in a unit test? Um, so maybe something like this. You pass in the two files, you have your brownies and your um, cookies, and then you have this, this tuple which says the mixer.speed should be medium in brownies and low in, uh, low in cookies, for example. Um, um, not only does this kind of um, help get rid of the imports, um, but it also allows you to have some sort of specification in the, in the tests themselves. Like you can literally see which differences are in there. So if you were burning your cookies on site but not your brownies, you can actually just see which, which ones might change. Again, uh, assert differences is, is not something in, in PyTest or unit test, uh, but there are examples on the GitHub if, you, if you're curious. So the idea of this is that then um, the domain experts themselves can then choose to maybe commit the flat file configs. These tests will then flag up if um, they, they change in some other way, if cookies maybe became, um, was, was cooked for longer or something like that, and it will flag up that these two are then not as diff more different than you thought they were, so then you can go and then change them. Um, if you've been following along so far, um, if your program is configuration driven, especially in um, this kind of smart kitchen, you could have hundreds, hundreds of configs. Um, a, a, similar might, a similar thing might be if you were making a config file for an artificial intelligence on neural network maybe. Um, 
you'd kind of want to tweak your capabilities. Um, you tweak your arguments based on your capability. For example, um, if you had multiple GPUs, you might want to change certain uh, same certain values in the config. Um, or if you have uh, lots of CPU, you might do lots of preprocessing. Again, changing the, these files in some way. Um, so bringing it back into uh, our smart kitchen. Uh, I don't know if you know this, but electric ovens and fan ovens need to get cooked at two different temperatures. I'm not really sure why myself, but uh, it's supposed to be 20 degrees less in a fan oven. So now uh, we would have two, uh, two tunnels, one for the electric cookies and one for the fan cookies. And that would go for every single recipe that we had in our code base. We would then basically double the amount of configs that we might need, which doesn't make sense. Um, also, b b you, then you might say, sorry. <laughs> um, so b besides um, being an annoying in that you have to pick these two different configs, this means that your user then has to know the capabilities of the system. They have to know whether they're running an electric cookie or whether they're running, running a fan cookie. So instead, what you might want to do is maybe something like this. Um, where you have this override section, and then you might say, uh, when the capability of, of the smart kitchen is a fan, uh, you then might want to change the temperature in some way. So you can see it goes from 200 to 180 if you're a fan oven. You still might be thinking, I could just hard code it. I could just go in the temperature function. If it's a fan oven, take away 20. Then we don't have to worry about any of this, and everything's fine. However, then you have an interesting scenario when you're debugging in that your uh, oven would be set at, say, 180, and your recipe says, in your config says 200. So if you're de debugging, you have then a disparity between the real world situation that you're seeing and the config file, which then leads to a distrust in the config files themselves because they're no longer applying what they said they were going to apply. Also, if you were having just a, a fan recipe, you would then have to add 20 degrees so that it would take away 20 degrees so it would give you the right number Um, but um, consider for a second that um, instead of hard coding it, um, there might be other situations where you might want to do this. For instance, if you might cook in a fan oven, your cookies might spread out more. So if we're considering maybe icing them, what this market you might want to do is trim the cookie to a nice perfect circle uh, and then ice them. But if the fan, if the fan oven spreads out more uh, than the um, electric oven, then we have another interesting scenario in that we would have to waste um, we would have to waste a lot of cookie unless if we had this override system in place. And if you had coded minus 20 in your temperature, um, you would then be stuck here in, in your trimming code. You would have to say, if it's a fan oven, take away one centimeter, which makes no sense in context. Um, so just to say what the effective configs might look like. Um, so if you were not a fan oven, um, your effective config would then maybe look something like this, uh, where the overrides have taken place. And if you're a fan oven, it might look something like that. So something that you never thought would interact with the capability of the system does. Um, so then you've given your power to the domain experts to then actually change the configs however they wanted from these capabilities without having to see the code at all, in a way, um, which again means that they're more likely to change the config files because they don't have to look in Python code. They don't have to go and find where it is, change all the unit tests. Everything is already there. Um, for this next slide, um, I, I'd like to potentially introduce something from Oxanopor, which is quite cool uh, because. I usually like talks when you come away with information about something that you hadn't expected. Um, so as the, com as the company name expects, at uh, Nanopore, we actually work with tiny holes in a membrane. And we have a current across this membrane, and when DNA gets thread through this tiny pore, um, and we measure the current, we actually see a disruption of the current as the DNA falls through. Um, and those, once you pass it to some sort of neural network or AI, actually give you the base pairs for DNA themselves. Um, so in Oxanopore, we work a lot with these, with these signals. So I want to give you an example of one of these signals. I 
kind of want to step over here, but this is going to be awkward. The big fat part there <laughs> is, is a strand going through the pore. That's, that's the information that we actually want. The bit up high there is when the strand has finished going through and it's just an empty pore, there's nothing in it. And the bit just after is actually an interesting phenomenon is where the strand actually gets stuck trying to, get pull, uh, trying to pull through this um, pore. So in, in processing this signal, what we actually want to do is break them up into chunks and figure out which parts are strand so we can pass them to some sort of base color to get our base pairs. Um, we need to know which ones are poor, so we do nothing. And that block, or that stuck part, we might need to know to uh, try and get the DNA out to try and fix our system. So uh, how you might do this is you might split them up into lots of little sections and use the numerical properties of the signal. For instance, you might say that strand, you have a min and a max current of maybe 100 to 150, and standard deviation of five, Again, with the other two, we're just putting in some properties that might allow us to pick apart which, which chunk of the signal um, belongs to which. This can become quite complex uh, if you consider that all of those statements are basically and. The min current has to be 100 and the max current has to be 150 and the standard deviation has to be five. You're limiting the domain users again in how they can uh, transform this config. Um, to process the signal, we actually use NumPy or Pandas. Um, don't hate me for what I'm about to say. Um, <laughs> you can actually do something similar to this and maybe pass the actual string to a safe eval function inside Pandas. Then you're not reinventing the wheel trying to make a pass it in Toml. There's one already there. And this gives you the added benefit that they can use ors, ands, they can group, they can use any numerical property they want because it's evaluated not not through us, it's evaluated through a third party, which again puts the power into the domain users themselves, meaning you don't have to edit code. <laughs> um, putting this example of, of pushing complexity into the config files back into our uh, smart kitchen, uh, our business is booming, uh, we actually want to move to baking a pie. I don't know if you know about anything about making pies, uh, but you bake the crust first, uh, you take it out of the oven, you put a filling on, and then you bake it again. We now have two oven steps to make a pie. Let's call it I don't know, oven one and oven two, it's fine. But that's not the best in that it doesn't tell you what order other things happen in. Like we, we mix, we would mix batter, we would mix dough, we would mix fillings. That, that tells us nothing about that. Instead, what you might want to do is to split each section um, and tag it with what appliance might be used, for example. Um, and then we have this really nice property at the bottom of recipe order, where you can read it and see actually which steps perfor are performed in which order when making it. You can now see we mix crust, then we do the oven pre-bake, then we mix filling, then we do the oven bake. Um, we've abstracted out not only the order of execution, but also the sections themselves. Uh, the, the code for this can be quite simple. Um, you would just loop through each of the recipe orders, find the, find the matching section, um, and again, from the um, hierarchy of the first example, you can then just pass these parameters onto actually the um, um, evaluating function themselves. You don't have to worry about it again. It's all entirely up to the function that's running. If you're looking at this, you might say, well, there are quite a few downsides. What if the section doesn't exist? What if they've named it wrong? What if they've put a number and not a string? Uh, I'd argue these are general problems with config files rather than just this example. If your user writes the string one instead of a one, that's still a problem outside of this. Um, so what you might want to do is have a unit or system tests that check this. Uh, you could also maybe use Pydantic as data validation to kind of validate your models before they get run. Um, so I'd like to go through now, there's are four examples of how you might want to change your configs so that um, scientists or other people don't have to edit the code themselves, they can just look in the config. Um, but debugging them, um, I have some fun tips. Uh, one is 
uh, in your log files or wherever your output may be, outputting the full config as well as maybe the effective config if you were using these overrides, because uh, TOMLs are just a file. They can change by design. We, we want users to change them. But then you can have a fun problem where a customer says, your software's crashed, and they're actually, they've actually changed the config, made it entirely different. So then you can have this and the code, and then you can see where might have been going wrong. This has actually saved my bacon a few times, um, to be honest. I can highly recommend that one. Um, another example um, is a tool to diff configs. Um, even if you decide to use maybe a more import structure rather than a flat file structure, this is still helpful because you can see exactly why two configs differ. Again, if we're comparing brownies versus cookies, if something was burning, you can see, oh, the, the brownies were in the oven for two hours, so that's, that's probably why. Um, uh, another example, uh, if you're reading your log files, what might be quite nice is uh, when you see the set temperature codes get run maybe, um, if you just put the uh, config that was to do with the temperature themselves, um, then when you're reading down the log file, you can see, oh, it's set temperature, here are the configs in there, here are the values that it's running with and continuing down. Um, I touched on this as well, um, having a Pydantic model for validation is also a good thing. We, we don't currently do this. We're, we're trying to move towards doing this to make configs a lot less crashable <laughs> and uh, error prone. Um, but if you're starting from scratch, I'd probably recommend trying to do some validation with something like that. Uh, uh, another interesting one is uh, pointless config options. And what I mean by this is as your project is moving along um, and you um, refactor, you change, you, you move things around. Uh, some of these config options might not get used anymore, um, but they're still in the config files. So you can have an interesting scenario where the user might change a value in the config file and it does absolutely nothing because it's not plumbed in anywhere. Um, again, this has happened a few times. Um, a, a nice way you could get around this um, is in your unit or system tests. You could maybe wrap a dictionary in another class, and every time you access a pop or change a value in this, you record that you've done it. Uh, and then at the end of a system test, uh, you can say which config options weren't accessed. And then that highlights a nice list of things that are in the config file but have not actually done any actions. Um, so you can choose to, to say, oh, this is exactly how I designed it, so that's fine. I'm going to add that to a list of exceptions or something like that. Um, so in summary, um, again, the, the QR code is there. If you want any of the examples, they are, they are on there. Um, so grouping config options um, really helps to increase clarity because it gives you them a nice structure and hierarchy. Um, try to not refactor <laughs> into library configs to increase portability in that you can copy and paste one file. You can see what's there. It's all, it's all there. Um, you might want to add these runtime overrides uh, to mitigate lots of similar configs um, because then that's pushing the capabilities of the system into the config file uh, rather than the users having to pick the capabilities of the system themselves because they're, they're prone to mistakes. Um, again, this is pushing uh, everything back into the domain experts, your bakers, your chefs, your scientists. Um, you might want to uh, push complexity into the config files themselves to increase flexibility. Again, this allows people to not change the code, but change it in a really, but change it in a really significant way from the config files that they're in, it's entirely different to, to what it was before, um, with no code on your part. It's, it's actually quite good. Um, outputting the effective config of what it runs is, is very, very key to a good debugging session. Um, it is more work on the developer side to maintain these, um, like these overrides, these groups, um, uh, these capabilities, um, but I think it makes it easier for non-technical people to, to contribute and check to these then, uh, because they don't have to dive through the code base to try and see what something's doing. They don't have to dive through the code base to try and change something. Um, the idea of all of this talk, really, 
is, is mainly to, to try and push your program into the config file themselves in a way that it, that it makes sense. Um, and that is everything I had. Thank you for listening. So, um, thank you for that very insightful talk about configs. And um, if any one of you has a question, please come forward to this, to the first microphone that you see. Oh no, this is the bit I was dreading. <laughs> uh, hi, uh, I have a question. Yeah, what will be the the limit? What to not put into the config file? Because you said that we should probably push logic a little bit to the to yeah. the config. So where there will be this boundary, you will not cross. I, I haven't met the line yet. Um, <laughs> I, I'd say it's, it's, it's more things that, 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 that change the flow of the system themselves. Like if you can tr try to manage to, to break your system down into these small parts, uh, if you can then expose how those parts get run, if that makes sense. Um, rather than, and then not breaking those parts down anymore because then there weeds madness. Okay, thanks. <laughs> Does anybody else have a question? Hi. Um, do you have any recommendations or word of wisdom around schemas for config files and what works and what doesn't do you use them? Uh, like I said, we're still trying to, to do that ourselves, um, so I don't have any great tips. Um, like I said, we're, we're trying to use Pydantic to validate them, but it's a, it's a slippery slope because introducing it into a code base is, is difficult for us. Yeah, no, I, I really like Pedantic, but when you read it into Pedantic, often the errors aren't so good. There's like an option that's not supported, so I was sort of wondering if you uh, could circumvent that with a schema, but it's probably a difficult topic. Yeah, no, I hadn't considered that. Yeah. Um, cool, yeah, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Hello. Do you have any experience with the documentation of the uh, config files, like that, you know, the project can grow over the time and have uh, hundreds of uh, configuration values. So you have some experience with the documenting of all of these values? Um, not, not specifically, um, to be honest. Um, what we try and do is those functions or parts, uh, we, we just export those doc strings and they usually say like how the config might affect them. You then have similar problems that the doc strings might become out of date, but it's, it's the best we've done so far. Um, I don't have any great tips. <laughs> Anyone else? We still have around two minutes for Q&A. Um, so you, you went with Tommel for the examples, and yep. uh, I was just wondering if that's a str an opinion or a thing that you feel strongly about versus like Jason, something like that. No, um, it just kind of forced upon us at the start, so we used it. Like I said, as, as long as it's like a dictionary kind of style structure, like anything that I've mentioned would, would apply. Um, I guess yeah. it's a also, maybe a way to manage the nesting a little bit as well, because Jason's like, you can... Yeah, yeah. That, that is true. Is that yeah. good answer? You'll take it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I do actually like the, the uh, table style mentioning of, of um, Tomo as well. It actually reads quite nice. One minute left. <laughs> Does anybody have any <laughs> questions left? If not, I'll just use this time to um, thank you for your uh, sharing your expertise, and here's a token of appreciation from the organizers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.